welcome back now we proceed to our next piece of news that is charidomidum now you see this picture over here this is a charidomidum okay this mound hemispherical mound and this structure built over here okay now you might have heard about the pyramids of egypt now what is there in the pyramids of egypt there are the remains of those people who have died the mummies which we call so they are buried over there in the pyramids you might have heard about this term tomb tomb is also you know a place where the the body of of i would say eminent personalities were buried like taj mahal is also a tomb so this charidomidum is also a kind of tomb in northeastern region or we call it the pyramids of the northeastern region where you know the remains or the bodies of the eminent personalities from the ahom kingdoms ahom kingdom was there in in i would say 13th century and it it spanned for multiple centuries also we learned about that personality lachit barfukan lachit barfukan uh, i think last month only it was included in the notes he was celebrating i think uh, the 400th year of his birth anniversary something like this was discussed as i can remember so he was also a general or he was also a warrior in the uh, this ahom dynasty so the rulers the remains of the rulers of the ahom dynasty are here in the in, in these i would say charidio maidams or which are called as the pyramids of north east of india or the tombs now assam chief minister recently said that the central government has decided to send a proposal to the unesco nominating charido maidam of ahom kingdom as world heritage site now unesco declares uh, various sites as world heritage sites in these sites either there are cultural heritage sites or there are natural heritage sites or there is a mix of cultural and natural in india there are 40 such uh, unesco world heritage sites in which you know i think there are 22 cultural 16 or 17 there are uh, natural and one is mixed cultural plus natural now as a task you have to find out this list of 40 unesco world heritage sites in india and do it for yourself after the class search it nothing i would say uh, nothing there to explain in that okay but you should know what are the sites and we have sent this proposal to unesco as as this year's nomination from india because every year uh, countries have to nominate and this year's nomination from india charido maidam okay now charido commonly known as the pyramids of assam was the original capital of the ahom kingdoms or kings charido remained the symbolic center of ahom kingdoms even though the capital of the kingdom moved many times from one place to the other it was built by Chaolong Sukhapa the founder of the dynasty in about 1229 CE location located at the foothills of Nagaland it is situated at a distance of around 30 km from the historical Shiv Sagar town in Assam what is charido known as or why is charido known as pyramids of assam it contains sacred burial grounds of ahom kings and queens and is also a place of the ancestral gods of the ahoms some 42 tombs the maidams of ahom kings and queens are present at the charidio hillocks that is why charidio is the name of the hillocks where they are located and maidam means tombs architecture it comprises a massive underground vault with one of more chambers having domical superstructure and covered by a heap of earthen mound and externally it appears a hemispherical mound here only we will discuss a brief about ahom dynasty because this dynasty has been in news uh, 
due to uh, Lachit Barfukan's 400th birth anniversary and again due to this Charidomidum. So, it becomes important for UPSC prelims that they can ask questions from this particular dynasty. Now, about this dynasty, founded by Chaolung Sukhafa, who entered the Brahmaputra Valley in 2028, they ruled Assam for 6 years and this Chaolung Sukhafa only uh, established Charaidio Maidem. The Homs created a new state by taking over the older political systems of the Bhuyans. Bhuyans were the landlords which were controlling the areas in that region. The home administration was a monarchical government, there was a king means with democratic and aristocratic values as well. The lower hierarchy was, you know, uh, kind of democratic people had a say in choosing their political leaders but not the king, it was a monarchy. The Aum society was divided into clans with the expansion of the kingdom. The clans moved and took charge of the designated territory. The Aum followed stringent travel policies to protect their motherland against the foreign invaders or for inward travel. The, in the 17th century, the Aum rule got weakened due to multiple Burmese invasions and internal conflicts in the Ahom dynasty. The Ahom kingdom was annexed by the British East India Company after the Treaty of Yandabu in 1826. And when Ahom kingdom was uh, annexed by the Britishers, it was made part of uh, Bengal province basically. It was Bengal and later on in the 1870s, it was made a separate province under British India and it was named as Assam. The entire northeast, all the seven states, all the seven states means Mizoram, Manipur, Nagaland, Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura, all these seven states were Assam under British India. Take care. So, this, this is the story of that region. You know, Charaido Maidam, Lachit Barfukan, the two main reasons why this particular time period and with the, uh, why this particular dynasty becomes important for this year's prelims. Okay. So, read about it. You might or might not be reading about it in history, uh, general studies, but yes, since it is in news and you are getting uh, the required information here, so you can definitely uh, look into this kind of information. Now, next piece of news is joint theatre commands. This piece of news is coming from, uh, I would say, uh, security point of view. Okay. Now, first you need to understand what a theatre is, a theatre of war, okay, where war is happening. And in a theatre of war, if only one of your force is operating, that is the army let's suppose, then you will have comparatively lesser edge if all the three forces or more than one force is operating. Like in a theatre of war, the army is also active, the air force is also active, the navy is also act active if required. And there is proper coordination among them. And there is a head which is controlling all the three forces in that particular theatre. In that particular theatre. Now in India, in the all over India basically, there is this chief of defence staff, CDS, which we discussed. I think in the month of November, October or November, when, in, when our new CDS was, was chosen. So, at that time we discussed, CDS is basically chief of defence staff, basically person heading the army, navy and the, the air force, unified command is there. But yes, theatre is basically a sub-regional concept in which we deploy forces which have proper communication among them, proper coordination and they are acting under a single head in that particular theatre. Okay. So, this is basically joint theatre. According to the government officials, the armed forces are finalising the theatrization plans that seek to integrate the army, navy and the Indian air force. Okay as well as their resources into specific theatre commands. Now, what is theatrization or theatre command means putting specific number of personnel from the three services that is Army, Navy and Air Force under a common commander in a specified geographical territory. 
in a specified geographical territory. Don't get confused with Chief of Defence Staff and Theatrization. Chief of Defence Staff is at the national level. It is it is basically heading all the three. Uh, I would say he is the head of the, uh, the all the three tri services: this Navy, Air Force, and uh, Army. Whereas theatrization in theatrization we create different theaters. Like it is it is believed that presently we have pre proposed four theaters. Take care. Like one is in the coastal regions, one is in uh, for in 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 the border, Indo-China border, Andaman Nicobar Islands. Okay. Now in those theaters, the Air Force, Navy, and Army they will be you know under one command and they will be managing that particular theater of war or or that theater of I would say conflict. At present, the Indian Army, Navy, and Air Force each has multiple commands. That are vertically split in terms of their command structure. Each one has their own commands. The army, they have their own vertical commands. The navy, they have their own vertical commands. The air force, they have their own vertical commands. So let's suppose this region. Let's suppose this is Kochi. Here, the navy will be present. The army will be present. The air force will be present. and they will be working under their individual commands vertical commands okay now there will be less coordination among them less cooperation among them but when a theater is formed if it is declared as a theater then there will be a single unified head which will be commanding the three services okay now this idea of theaterization was uh, given by the Cargill Review Committee just after the Cargill War, and it was also given by D. B. Shikatkar Committee. The D. B. Shikatkar Committee recommended the office or setting up the office of the Chief of Defence Staff (CDS). Right. Now global examples. The word theatre warfare. Became more prominent during World War II. It became more prominent during World War II. It is not a new term. And as of now, all major countries like China, Russia, US, UK, and France work on a theater command concept. For example, China's Western Theater Command looks after the entire borders with India. It is the latest entrant into a into the theater con concept, the China, basically. Now in India. The need for a unified approach was brought after the 1999 Kargil battle or Kargil war. The Kargil Review Committee, the Narish Chandra Committee, and the group of ministers had called for structural changes in higher defence management. Then again, it was the Shikatkar Committee which had recommended creation of the post of Chief Def Chief of Defence Staff (CDF) and Theatre Commands also was recommended by Shikatkar. Now, the proposed or expected details, however, it is not explicitly revealed by the uh, armed forces that this is going to be the theatre, but the proposed or the, the expected details are like the details are not immediately clear. Reports say that single service commands that currently exist would be combined into just four geographical commands. There will be four uh, commands. First is the Western Theatre Command and uh, basically, this will be uh, in the western part of India, uh, and, and obviously for Pakistan, it will be there. The Northern Theatre Command for the border with China, it will be there. Maritime Command for Indian Ocean region, it will be there. And Island Command, already functional kind of, and uh, in in the Andaman Nicobar Control Center, it is there. Okay. So basically, these are the four proposed theatres. Next piece of news is basically. With respect to the National Tourism Day, National Tourism Day we celebrate on the 25th of January every year. And Ministry of Railways, in partnership with Ministry of Tourism, is launching its Jagannath Yatra train package, which will take various, I would say, devotees to this particular uh, place where Jagannath Yatra is there. It is also linked to the theme-based tourist circuit trains 
like there is this buddhist circuit or there is this ambedkar circuit in which we are developing connectivity rail connectivity road connectivity which will be connecting imminent or important places with respect to let's suppose in buddhist circuit with respect to the life of buddha in respect to ambedkar circuit with respect to life of b r ambedkar so likewise jagannath yatra circuit is also being envisaged by ministry of railways ministry of tourism on this particular national tourism day but theek hai we have to understand more about it that the tourism sector in india in the past 75 years india has become synonymous with tourism because we have all or i would say immense potential of tourism why i'm saying that we have immense potential of tourism because we have a lot of i would say cultural diversity cultural richness and this cultural diversity and cultural richness contributes towards i would say or or is responsible for religious tourism cultural tourism in which people come and visit different uh, i would say religious places cultural places or places having cultural importance then we have a lot of natural beauty as well we have a lot of uh, i would say we, we have the mountains in the form of himalayas we have the coastline vast coastline of 7500 kilometers 7516 kilometers to be precise so this also has potential of of i would say uh, uh, tourism then we have the desert thar desert is there then we have marshy lands run of kutch we have the plateau region deccan plateau we have the beautiful northeast we have the plains almost all geographical geographical features are present in india which create i would say a potential uh, ground for tourism in india theek hai and since the last 75 years tourism has grown and grown and grown and grown only on in india theek hai although during the covid years it was given a big blow because everyone was locked down but yes after uh, lifting the restrictions we again saw an exponential rise in tourism we might all have seen you know many traffic jams in which uh, you know the media was covering in himachal pradesh uttarakhand and all theek hai so apart from it a new category like we have the adventure sports or adventure tourism in which we go to the we, we go and visit national parks or we go for adventure sports like bungee jumping and all so we have created hubs for these as well so in the past 75 years india has become synonymous with tourism spirituality transformation culture and diversity the tourism sector generated 16.91 lakh crore or usd 240 billion dollars or 9.2% of india's gdp in 2018 and supported around 42.67 million jobs or 8.1% of the total employment india is estimated to contribute 250 billion dollars which will be way more than i would say uh, 240 billion dollars in uh, from from tourism 137 million jobs tourism sector 57 billion dollars in foreign exchange earnings and 25 million foreign tourist arrivals and it is to be achieved by 2030 with tourism as its primary concern the ministry of tourism has launched a number of i would say exercises and implemented a four pronged development strategy of tourism in india improving the connectivity that is air rail and roads enhancing tourism infrastructure and dependent services you see the uh, multiple places like ujjain mahakaleshwar temple complex it has been developed it has been revamped nowadays if you go to uh, vrindavan or mathura the government has also chalked out a plan to revamp that area that that area where for that main temple in vrindavan is there the bake bihari temple people are protesting against it the locals over there but yes the government has decided to do that the ram mandir temple complex in ayodhya so the buddhist circuit for example so it has been enhanced it has been revamped then streamlining branding and promotion india is also you know promoting its tourism uh, the way various state governments like uh, this year there was this dharamshala declaration in which uh, ministers from all the states they met in this place dharamshala in himachal pradesh and they declared this dharamshala declaration in which they wanted to increase tourism the government of india has given them a free hand to connect with consulates and embassies abroad 
and if they want to promote their tourism over there in those respective countries, they can. So, this is basically branding and, and uh, you know, the campaigns have to be done, showcasing the culture and heritage. We have to showcase our culture and heritage, we have to show this richness, we have to show this diversity, which will li act like an attracting power. Now, various tourist circuits have been promoted like the Ambedkar circuit, the Buddhist circuit, the Himalayan circuit, etc, etc. Then a number of projects have been sanctioned on the Swadesh Darshan scheme for building tourist infrastructure across various themes. The pilgrimage, rejuvenation and spiritual augmentation drive Prashad scheme aims to strengthen the tourist facilities in, in around spiritual locations like example which I gave you of Vrindavan recently under which 39 projects have been sanctioned in 24 states. According to the Ministry of Tourism, the financial assistance to the tourism sector which is the biggest sufferer due to COVID continues to be extended up to 31st March 2023. Now, efforts to promote tourism in India. The promotion of India's tourism will only be effective when different ministries at the union and states work in cohesion by combining their domain expertise. Now, why I am saying this, that why the, the first point is there, cooperation between various ministries, we will see through various examples. Abhi. Okay. As a result, the Ministry of Tourism has prioritized the task of inter-ministerial cooperation and coordination. The Ministry of Tourism has taken up this task that we will, you know, uh, enable this collab cooperation or connection or, or I would say cohesion between various ministries. Today, the Ministry of Tourism coordinates its work effectively with over 20 central government ministries in the promotion and development of tourism in the country. For example, now starts the example, the Ministry of Tourism and Ministry of Home Affairs organized the National Conference on Tourist Police to develop tourist specific policing so that the tourists feel safe, if they, they feel secure. This is one of the major concerns or one of the major challenges that, you know, the tourists do not feel safe and secure. And in this, we are sensitizing or we are training the police officers or the police in the states, which, which comes under the Ministry of Home Affairs. That is why this, there is this collaboration between Ministry of Tourism and Ministry of uh, Home Affairs. Then, in partnership with Ministry of Education, Tourism Ministry has begun establishing Yuva Tourism clubs to nurture young ambassadors of Indian tourism. Basically, in every district they plan to uh, create this uh, Yuva Tourism Club in which the youth of that particular district will act like volunteers and assist those people who are coming to their district or their places or their region as tourists. In another incidence, if I have to talk about Ministry of Ports, Shipping and Waterways is aiming to make India an attractive cruise tourism destination using state-of-the-art infrastructure and for that we have seen MV Ganga Vilas although it is a, uh, run by a private company but yes this particular ministry ministry of uh, I would say uh, ports shipping and waterways was very much instrumental in getting that particular uh, cruise in line or implemented in partnership with ministry of external affairs tourism officers have been placed in 20 Indian missions or embassies in countries that contribute to some of the highest foreign tourist arrivals in India. Similarly, with Ministry of Roadways and Petroleum Ministry, steps are being taken to ensure that highways and fuel stations have clean sanitation infrastructure. Ministry of Tourism is also funding several commercial flight routes in partnership with Ministry of Civil Aviation, making them viable in, by providing cheap airfare or cheap flights to the tourists. However, it is not enough if there is a pledge to work together. This needs to be formalized through structures and institutions. Only by pledging that we will coordinate and we will work will not do. We will have to make certain institutions like for infrastructure development. Just understand, I am comparing this coordination between Ministry of Tourism and other various ministries for promoting tourism. This coordination mechanism has been institutionalized and formalized in another domain that is for infrastructure development. For infrastructure development like roads, railways, ports and all, there is this Pradhan Mantri Gati Shakti Yojana in which 16 ministries have come together on that digital platform, the Gati Shakti platform 
for proper coordination so that infrastructure projects can be implemented fastly and efficiently. Similarly, this kind of coordination mechanism or this type of coordination mechanism is has to be formalized or institutionalized in this tourism sphere also which will be promoting tourism. So, what Gati Shakti is for infrastructure uh, development in India or infrastructure se sector in India, there should be this X portal or this X institution which will be for promoting tourism in India. Then Visit India Year 2023, the Ministry of Tourism's declaration of Visit India Year 2023 aims to promote various tourism products and destinations to increase India's share in global tourism market. So, this 2023 we are celebrating Visit India Year 2023. Now, next is Chat GPT. Chat GPT is basically an, you know, you might have visited various, I would say, uh, websites and in those websites there is this uh, chat option in which you write your query and from there you get an automated response. Okay, You might have visited certain apps in which there is automated response. So similarly is this chat GPT but yes this is a bit advanced. This is a bit advanced. Now this chat uh, I would say it, it, these are called as chat bots. In which which are instrumental for you know uh, replying you now this particular chatbot chat GPT is highly intelligent is highly intelligent because it has been created by using artificial intelligence and advanced machine learning tools now once you are chatting with it you know you you raise a problem that problem is not being able to or is not be but I would say completely solved by that chatbot, it becomes a learning for that chatbot and if similar kind of problem comes again in the future, then it will give you enhanced inputs, it will give you enhanced responses keeping or keeping that learning in mind which it did earlier. Means, if there was something short fall in that particular chatbot, then it learns from that particular episode and in future, it gives you more precise answers means it is not responding with the same answers again and again it learns from its experience and people are using this chat gpt to write stories this automatically writes stories for you this this particular uh, chat gpt can write coding programs for you you just have to enter manually that write a coding program for me which solves this problem this chat gpt will write it for you this is so advanced it can convert various text into various other languages it is so advanced so people were fearing also that this will replace humans and uh, this this might hamper the jobs however this is this is the best possible i would say use of technology or this is the best possible human technology interface so let's read about it in detail recently chat gpt the artificial intelligence powered chatbot crossed 1 million users in less than a week since it was officially made available to the public. What is ChatGPT? It is a language generation software that has been designed to carry conversations with people. The tool has been developed with or developed by OpenAI, a research institute founded in 2015 by a group of entrepreneurs and researchers including Elon Musk. Kuch to alag ho gai, adbut ho gai. Then Sam Altman and Greg Brockman. The company is best known for DAL E, this software, the AI based text to image generator. If we enter text and if we want to create an image, then we can type the text, text there and an image will be generated automatically by this DAL E software. This DAL E software was also developed by OpenAI. It is based on company's GPT 3.5 series of language learning models. GPT here stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. And this is a kind of computer language model that relies on deep learning techniques to produce human-like text based on inputs. We type an input, we type a query, this will respond to that. And this response is basically not similar all the time. 
it is not that that kind of automated response we get it 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 will have this ability to understand it and then it may respond you if it has some shortcomings in those responses it will learn from those shortcomings and in the future if someone else poses that question it will give that person an enhanced i would say answers so this is that kind of chatbot now features some of its features include the following answering follow up questions by the clients challenging incorrect premises if the clients are asking wrong questions or asking in the wrong direction then you know it will uh, clarify it to them rejecting inappropriate queries and even admitting its mistakes it is trained on an enormous amount of text data from archived books wikipedia etc and learn to recognize patterns that enable it to produce its own text mimicking various writing styles it is a part of larger generative ai which refers to the ability of computers to automatically create text videos photos and other media using cutting edge machine learning technologies this chatbot powered by ai makes use of reinforcement learning from human feedback it is called as rlhf technology now what is this rlhf technology this technology produces different answers for the same question in the future since it improves over time and understands queries better through machine learning as i told you that it will continuously learn from its performances and it will give enhanced answers in the future from its learnings so that is reinforcement learning from human feedback now, significance this is interesting chat gpt's ability to learn and adapt quickly to new information means that it can be trained to handle new topics and tasks without the need for extensive retraining it automatically learns many experts believe that chat gpt's advanced capabilities will be a valuable asset for companies in the field of such as customer service online education and market research it can respond to a large range of questions while imitating human speaking styles example answering customer service queries help debug a code etc it is being seen as a replacement for the basic emails party planning lists cvs etc even you no know, homework in in colleges and all it can also create or it can also do creative tasks such as writing a story and can explain scientific concepts and answers any answer any questions that needs factual answers now chat gpt is a much more than a chatbot for example it can be asked to write a program or even a simple software application and it will do it for you it is also capable of reviewing and writing codes in seconds making the future of coders grim basically those coders who are in coding and they take long uh, i would say a long time or longer periods to form a code this chat gpt can do it in seconds for you you just have to input that hey chat gpt create a program or or create a code for me to resolve this problem so it will create a code for you to resolve this problem in seconds so chat gpt has also been trained to decline inappropriate requests presumably those which are illegal in nature there are certain limitations also obviously uh, technology is a double edged sword so there will be good or there there will be positives there will be negatives as well the chat gpt displayed racial and sexist biases which remains a problem with almost a all ai models there is racial discrimination in the in which is inbuilt which is inherent though it gives grammatically correct and read well answers but few users have pointed out that these lack context and substance and are more generalized in nature and it also overuses certain phrases due to its biases in the training data it also occasionally produces inaccurate information that is knowledge is restricted to global events that occurred before 2021 not after that since it was developed in 2021 it is also unable to provide answers to country specific questions so generalized answers will be there in that next piece of news national voters day the election commission of india is celebrating 13th national voters day on 25th january 2023 now this national voters day basically the uh this year's theme was nothing like voting 
I vote for sure. It is written over here, and that is NVD National Voters Day 2023. ठीक है. In Hindi, if you want to translate, vote जैसा कुछ नहीं, vote जरूर डालेंगे हम. ठीक है. तो basically it is for generating awareness among the people that voting should be practiced. diligently the national voters day has been celebrated january 25 every year since 2011 we are celebrating this all across the country to mark the foundation day of election commission of india that is 25th january 1950 so mind you since 2011 we are celebrating it every year and this 2023 is the 13th national voters day and uh, why because election commission of india was formed on this day in 1950 theek okay. hai The main purpose of the celebration is to create electoral awareness among citizens and encourage them to participate in the electoral process. Dedicated to the voters of the country, National Voters Day is also used to facilitate the enrollment of voters, especially the new eligible young voters. The theme for 2023 already discussed nothing like voting. I vote for sure. Then next is Bhar OS bhar stands for bharat os stands for operating system like you might be using android phones so android is the operating system of your phone if you are using an iphone then ios is the operating system of your phone so ios is being developed by apple and uh, this uh, the the other one which i talked about is is uh, android has been developed by google theek okay. hai so Bhar OS is being is is an indigenous operating system, which is being developed by this company that is called as J and K Operations Private Limited, a non-profit organization incubated at the IIT Madras, and funded by Department of Science and Technology. Now, don't get confused that Bhar OS or Bharat OS is not being developed by the government, but it is being developed by a non-profit organization in India that is J and K Technologies. Now, key features of Bhar OS is a mobile operating system, similar to Android or iOS. It is based on an AOSP, Android Open Source Project operating system, and does not use any Google apps or services. Now, this Android Open Source Project is basically a kind of uh, uh, operating system which is inspired from the already existing Android. Okay, and you can. create various operating systems using this aosp theek okay. hai it would support native over the air updates native over the air updates nota updates means like presently you have some notifications that you need to update this particular app or you need to update your entire software here you will not get such kind of uh, notifications whenever a, an update will be there it will automatically be updated you don't have to punch in manually that this update is required to update it as well theek okay. hai and no default apps will be there no default apps means it will be clean it will be a clean slate like in in android there is this default app like google maps and all are already pre installed the maps related to google are already pre installed so here no pre installed apps will be there it will be a clean slate kind of it will employ private app store services pass system to examine and curate apps that are safe for users basically it 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 will have this uh, surveillance mechanism or it will have this review mechanism in which it will review the applications which are safe uh, for the users those applications will only be hosted by the the uh, bhar os server and those will be downloadable by the users who are using this particular operating system okay these systems enable smartphone users to interact with their devices and access their features while also ensuring their safety the current status is that the current version of bhar os includes third party apps such as duck duck go and signal by default now what is native over the air security updates and bug fixes will be automatically installed rather than users having to check for updates and implement them on their own and what is no default app setting basically users do not have to keep or use pre installed apps in this mobile operating system like i told you that android comes with already pre defined or pre installed apps like the google system is there the gmail is there and and google maps is there already pre installed 
so this will be a clean slate now next piece of news is norovirus obviously it is a virus the kerala health department recently confirmed two cases of norovirus uh, that is this gastrointestinal infection gastrointestinal infection means it if impacts the intestinal region okay and uh, in 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 class 1 students in ernakulam district small kids 6 years now effects of norovirus on the body mild fever and chills you get lethargy you feel lazy headaches you get vomiting stomach pain okay symptoms appear 12 to 12, 48 hours after the initial infection is there okay symptoms last 1 to 3 days virus is contagious up to 2 weeks diarrhea you get in diarrhea means you you get continuous motions like like loose motions we call it or you you continually vomit that is that is uh, symptoms of diarrhea okay and you also get abdominal cramps you you uh, feel pain a lot in your stomach and you get body aches like in your calves and all it will be aching okay so this is basically these are basically the symptoms of norovirus now about norovirus also known as the winter vomiting bug causes vomiting and diarrhea infection agents the most common the most common infective agents is contaminated water or food the virus spreads via feces to the mouth consuming contaminated food or liquids touching contaminated surface or objects or coming to direct contact with an infected person direct contact se bhi ho sakta hai and if you come in contact with contaminated i would say objects then also it can happen no symptoms already discussed i'll repeat it again acute gastro uh, enteritis enteritis is caused by inflammation of the stomach or intestine diarrhea vomiting nausea stomach ache are also the symptoms fever fever headache and muscle pain may also persist the symptoms usually appear 12 to 48 hours after the virus has been exposed it affects particularly the elderly the people suffering from the illness children okay and severity although these virus outbreaks are rarely severe they can spread quickly if proper precautions are not taken and as uh, of now no fatality has been reported due to norovirus but it has the potential to become an epidemic and then has the potential to become a pandemic as well okay so this is all about norovirus now next piece of news the state visit of egyptian president now is uh, the president of egypt visited india for its republic day celebrations as the chief guest so in this news piece we will be discussing the the importance of egypt to us and why what were what were what could be the probable reasons why we invited the egyptian president to our republic day parade as chief guest now president of the arab republic of egypt abdel fatah al sisi is on a state visit to india from 24 to 26 january 2023 president sisi who is on his second state visit to india will also be the chief guest on india's 74th republic day so it is president sisi's second state visit to india but for the first time president of egypt has been invited as chief guest on our republic day and for the very first time also a military contingent from egyptian army will also participate in the republic day parade this time means uh, any foreign forces participating is there that is egyptian forces will participate now significance of the invitation an invitation to be the republic day chief guest is highly symbolic basically it symbolizes that either we want to increase you know uh, integration with you or we want to increase our our level of i would say interactions with you you are important country to india this kind of signal or this kind of symbol we want to give to that particular country and an invitation to the uh to be the republic day chief guest is highly symbolic from the indian government's perspective the choice of chief guest every year is dictated by a number of reasons these reasons are st- 
strategic and diplomatic, business interests and international geopolitics. So these are the reasons, mainly these are the reasons which, which dictate or, or which decide the invitation to be the chief guest in India's Republic Day Parade. Now India-Egypt relationships at a glance if we see, India and Egypt enjoy warm and friendly relationships. Actually not from now, it is from the, the uh, era of non-alignment, like, like era of non-alignment is during the Cold War period, the Cold War was between USSR and USA. And in that period, there was this third block also which emerged in the name in the form of NAM, non-alignment movement, which was neither aligned towards the USA capitalist block nor towards USSR's socialist block. It was non-aligned, it was in the center. And Egypt was one of the founding members along with India of NAM. India, Egypt, Ghana, Yugoslav, uh, I think Czechoslovakia and Indonesia. These were the five founding members of NAM. And since then, we have our relations with Egypt. It was, I think, Yugoslavia, not Czechoslovakia. India and Egypt are celebrating 75 years of establishment of diplomatic relations. Means in 1947 only we gave or we had established diplomatic relations with Egypt. Egypt has also been invited as guest country during India's presidency of G20 in 2022-23. Now, trade relations between India and uh, Egypt, 7.26 billion dollar is the total trade. Trade is equal to import plus export. So, what do, how much we export, how much we import? The trade, ba trade was fairly balanced, means almost imports are equal to exports. US 3.74 billion Indian exports to Egypt and US 3.52 billion Imports from Egypt to India are there. Roughly, India's exports to Egypt are slightly above as compared to Russian uh, Egyptian imports. More than 50 Indian companies have invested around 3.15 billion dollars in diverse sector of Egyptian economy, including chemicals, energy, textiles, garment, agribusiness, retail, etc. Now, defense cooperation. If I talk between the two, in October 2021, Desert Warrior exercise was conducted as the first ever joint tactical exercise by air force of the two countries and very recently we have decided that the special forces of both the countries will also be doing an exercise. The Egyptians have also shown some interest in India's Tejas fighter jets and Dhruv light attack helicopters which we might be selling to Egypt. Cooperation during COVID-19 and Russia-Ukraine war, this is interesting. When India was hit hard by the second wave of COVID that was in 2021. It was Egypt who dispatched three plane loads of medical supplies and providing 300,000 doses of remdesivir in May 2021, which was very much important at that time. India also reciprocated. Now, why? Egypt is the world's largest importer of wheat. And due to this Russia-Ukraine war, the basically Russia uh, created a blockade on Ukrainian ports through which Ukraine used to export wheat. It did not allow wheat to get exported. At that time, basically India also imposed export bans on wheat because we wanted to feed our population. But we lifted those export bans specially for Egypt and we gave them around, you know, 61,000 tons of wheat. We made an exception for Egypt. We lifted our export bans for Egypt and we exported 61,000 of wheat to Egypt. Why Egypt has been chosen? Basically pushed to engage the global south. We know what global south means, the developing countries and Egypt is also a developing country. So we want to engage with developing countries and we want to, you know, become their voice in the G20 summit. So Egypt is one such component or one such part of the global south. Then rekindling of the principles of non-alignment. We want to, you know, uh, remember again or we want to commemorate those principles of non-alignment which we followed and in today's world, again, the world is getting divided, Russia versus the West. So, this principle of non-alignment is also becoming prominent today. So, Egypt was an ancient partner, a founding member of non-alignment movement. 
Then strategic weight of Egypt if I talk about with a population of almost 110 million Egypt is situated at the location that straddles Africa and Asia and it is also a gateway to Europe. It has a standing army that is the largest in the region, a capital that hosts the League of Arab States and a diplomatic presence that punches above its weight in the global affairs. Why? Because there is this Suez Canal. I will just show you where Suez Canal is. That is why Egypt punches way above its uh, global stature. India wants to increase its ties with Egypt also, which is a key player in the politics of both the Arab world as well as Africa. Now, economic importance of Egypt. Egypt has boosted its trade with signing with uh, by signing various agreements, basically free trade agreements with different parts of the world, with Africa, with Europe, with Latin America, with the Arab world as well. It has also been a major, major gateway markets to Africa and Europe because of the Suez Canal. Then resetting India's ties with Muslim majority countries. Now it will give a signal to the Muslim majority countries that we want to establish ties with you. We are not, you know, as we are painted that India is not a Hindu country or India is not a Hindu government. India does not have a Hindu government. India has a secular government. India is a secular country. And we want to, you know, increase our ties with the Muslim countries as well. And by inviting Egypt or uh, President of Egypt as a chief guest, we are signifying this. Then Egypt's plans to develop Suez Canal economic zone into a global manufacturing hub. Now, before understanding this, we'll go to where the we will see where Suez Canal is basically. This is the Red Sea. This is Egypt. This is the Suez Canal and this is the Mediterranean Sea and here is Europe. Take care. So whatever trade from Europe comes to Asia passes through the Suez Canal and Egypt basically wants to develop an industrial zone in this Suez Canal region. An industrial zone in this Suez Canal region in which it wants to set up various industries. And those industries will cater to the European market, to the Asian market as well, because Egypt's location is in the center. And China is, is very much interested in this, in the development of this, because it is also, uh, you know, promoting China's Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI project. So, that is why uh, Egypt is, you know, developing this Suez Canal. Also, we will see through this. No, I hope you can see that. This is basically Suez Canal. This is Suez Canal. So from Europe, anything which has to come to Asia passes through this. Or anything from Asia which has to go to Europe passes through this. This is the shortest route. Otherwise, we will have to adopt this long route. This basically shortens the route, the Suez Canal. And Egypt has control over Suez Canal. Now, Egypt's plans to develop Suez Canal Economic Zone, SC Zone, into a global manufacturing hub. This ambition plan to develop Suez Canal Economic Zone into a global manufacturing hub are now gathering critical mass. SC Zone sits astride both banks of Suez Canal, a strategic waterway that connects Mediterranean with Red Sea and provides the shortage link between Europe and Asia. Almost 20% of global container trade takes place through this canal. China, as usual, has been the first to take advantage of opportunities presented by the SC zone. China views SC zone as part of its Belt and Road and Maritime Silk Road projects. A deeper economic engagement with Egypt therefore requires an additional, I would say, strategic footprint in Egypt. India's footprint in Egypt, it will increase and we will be able to counter China. Next, light tank Zorawar. This is the tank which you can see. Now, who was Zorabar? Uh, after whom this tank was is, is named? He was a military general, Zorabar Singh Kahaluria, and had served under the Jammu's Raja Gulab Singh in the 19th century. He is honored for his conquests in the Himalayas, including Ladakh, Tibet, Baltistan, and Skardu regions. Now, according to the recent report, DRDO and LNT, a private company, and a government company developed Zolavar light tank 
that is under fabrication and will be rolled out soon. The DAC that is Defence Acquisition Council of Defence Ministry recently accorded the approval for acceptance of necessity AON which is called it is it is a document in which or by which or by signing which in this document the government expresses that now there is a necessity and we need this kind of I would say equipment and we want to purchase 354 of such tanks. Okay. So, this is going to be Zorabar. Now, about the tank if I talk about it is an indigenously designed and developed light tank in India developed by DRDO Defence Research and Development Organisation in collaboration with LNT Larsen and Tubro Limited. Now, features of this is that it is designed to operate in varying terrain from high altitude areas and marginal terrains to island territories. It will be highly transportable for rapid deployment to meet operational situation that is that is very much important that it should be transportable. It will be equipped with all modern technologies such as artificial intelligence, drone integration, amphibious operation capability means on land and as well as on water. It will weigh less than 25,000 tons or uh, sorry 25 tons not 25,000 25 tons with a high power to weight ratio as well as superior firepower and protection. Now, next piece of news is with respect to olive ridley turtles. These turtles which you can see have this olive colored uh, I would say hunchback due to which the name is olive ridley turtles. Now since early January a group of locals have photographed 70 olive ridley turtles which have been found dead in their breeding grounds between Kakinada and Antarvedi in Godavari region of Andhra Pradesh. The scientific name Lepidochelis olivaceae are the smallest and most abundant of all sea turtles found in the world. They are most abundant and smallest inhabiting warm waters of the Pacific, Atlantic and Indian Oceans. These turtles are best known for their unique mass nesting called Aribada where thousands of females come together on the same beach to lay eggs. Laying of eggs is known as nesting. Though found in abundance, their numbers have been declining over the past few years and the species have been recognized as vulnerable by IUCN Red List. The turtle's olive colored cap carapace, heart shaped and round, carapace is basically the hunchback, the, the hard I would say shell of the turtle gives them their name that is olive ridley turtle. These turtles spend their entire lives in the ocean, migrate thousands of kilometers between feeding and mating grounds in their course in the course of a year. They face serious threats across their migratory route, habitat, nesting beaches due to human activities. Basically while coming here while migrating they face various threats like for example the fishing community they you know <clears throat> do fishing by spreading nets and they get caught in those nets so while migrating they get caught then when they reach if they are able to reach the shores then they do nesting over there there also due to various reasons uh, there is a threat to them there is a threat to their existence then turtle unfriendly fishing practices as I told you and they get entangled in trawl nets and gill nets then poaching for their meat, shell, leather and their eggs is done and this is done despite that they are banned under sites appendix 1 and we, we also talked about sites in the month of November. Development and exploitation of nesting beaches for ports and tourist centers due to which their nesting sites are impacted because uh, they, they lay eggs on the beaches and the beaches are used by tourists mass mortality of olive ridleys. The breeding grounds between Kakinada and Antarvedi have been witnessing mass mortality of the turtles over the past few years. This is mainly attributed to the effluents that are discharged from the aqua ponds. There are a lot of effluents like for ex excess fertilizers and all which are you know in, in uh, which, which are you know uh, going into the sea or which are going into those areas where olive ridley turtles come and stay and they consume those and uh, that that uh, kills them. Then a complaint has been filed in the National Green Tribunal 
against marine and ground water pollution in the Kona Sima region. This is uh, Odisha and, and uh, Andhra Pradesh region. Other threats to olive ridleys, operation of fishing boats in the ecologically sensitive, I would say rookery, that is a breeding colony is called as a rookery. So, where, there, uh, where this breeding zone is there, where this rookery is there, where this breeding colony is there of the, the olive ridley turtles, their fishing should be restricted because fishing actually entangles them in the nets and harms their life. Now, breeding grounds, when I talk about breeding grounds, now this is basically Gahir Mata. Gahir Mata is, is basically their main breeding ground and this Devi Mouth is also one of their main breeding grounds. This is Odisha and Andhra Pradesh coast. Then Rushikulia, another breeding ground. Mass nesting beaches, these are. These three beaches are mass nesting beaches where they come and lay eggs. Okay. The olive ridley turtles come to the beaches of Odisha coast annually between November and December and stay on until April and May. These turtles choose the narrow beaches near estuaries and bays for laying their eggs. Now, steps for conservation. Legal protection, they are protected under Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Then setting up of rookeries, nesting grounds for them to ensure safe breeding and collect eggs through the XC2 conservation methods. Now what we do is, uh, you know, when they lay their eggs, we safely collect their eggs and keep them in, in that particular environment in which they, they uh, hatch and new turtles are born. So XC2 conservation is also done. XC2 means from someone from external or uh, not so someone apart from the turtles are going and conserving their eggs and someone apart is we humans we go conserve their eggs and those eggs hatch into turtles now fencing of the nesting area and patrolling it so where the nesting happens we fence it we patrol it turtle excluded devices like the fishermen community when they are using nets so their nets should be like you know those designed in such a way that they exclude the capture of turtles in that, those are called as turtle excluder devices. Then Operation Olivia is also being run as the nesting period stretches over 6 months. The Indian Coast Guard undertake the Olive Ridley Turtle Protection Program every year means and, and they have named it as Operation Olivia. Come to the second last report, this global gender gap report basically uh, is released by World Economic Forum. And it ranks countries on the basis of participation of women at various levels. And it, it highlights the gap between the ma males and the females. All over the world, the males are said to be above females. Basically, the world is a patriarchal society which we live in. But this gender gap report highlights this gap. And this gap is assessed by the gender gap report on the basis of, I would say, four parameters. These four parameters... We will look into it. First is economic participation and opportunity by females, educational attainment of females, health and survival of females and political empowerment of females. On these four parameters, we judge and we identify the gap between males and females in a particular country. The larger the gap, the, big problem it, the bigger the problem is. Now, when I talk about the fourth, I would say, component, political empowerment. Basically, we have empowered women in India at the panchayat level, but the World Economic Forum was not considering it before 2023. But now the World Economic Forum will rank countries based upon the participation of women at the panchayat level, means at the local level also, in its upcoming global gender gap reports. And hence, we are anticipating that our performance will be better in the coming indexes. According to an assurance given to the Indian Women and Child Development Minister, who recently reiterated the flaws in the ranking system at Davos, the WEF is examining. Now, the WEF is re-examining and changing its indices for the ranking. Now, gender gap report. When I talk about India's rank in 2022, it was 0, uh, 135 and the score was 0.629. Now you can see the four components which we discussed, political empowerment, economic participation and opportunity, educational appoint, uh, attainment and health and survival. Okay. So 
India's performance and ranks on these particular uh, parameters we can see here, rank 48 on political empowerment, 143 on economic participation and opportunity, 107 on educational attainment and 146 on health and survival. Overall rank 135. In 2021, overall rank was 140. 51 in this political empowerment, economic participation and opportunity 151, educational attainment 114, health and survival 155. It is the comparison and in 2023, we are expecting the rank to further increase because at the local level also it will be considered. And finally, to the last piece of news is Thiruvananth, Thiruvananth Puram Declaration. It is again linked to Global Gender Gap Index. The first national women legislative or legislators conference in Kerala concluded with the adoption of Thiruvananth Puram Declaration. The main theme of Thiruvananth Puram Declaration was the long pending women's reservation bill. Since 1996, it has been pending for 33% reservation for women in the Lok Sabha and state legislatures should be there. So this was discussed and if this happens, this will increase the female participation in politics at the national and state levels as well. The low representation of women in parliament, that is lack of political empowerment, is the main reason for India's poor performance in gender gap index published by the World Economic Forum and that is why we did this Thiruvananth Puram declaration. About the declaration, if I talk about the president of India, now the former president, Sri Namnath Kovin, inaugurated the National Women Legislators Conference 2022 in Thiruvananth Puram. The conference is being hosted by Kerala Legislative Assembly as part of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. On this link, you can click and you can read about the president's address as well. So with, with this, we have ended uh, the session and we will move on to the doubt session very shortly and we will be discussing the doubts and the very important question, how important are NCRTs for the preparation. Okay. See you on the other hand in the doubt session. Mm -hmm.